Welcome to Out of the Question, a podcast that looks behind some common questions and uncovers the question behind the question while providing real solutions for biblical world and life view. Your co-hosts are Pastor Steve Macias and Andrea Schwartz, a teacher and mentor. Thanks for listening to the 88th episode of the Out of the Question podcast. Today I'm flying solo as my co-host, Father Steve Macias, had to attend to some pastoral duties. My guests today are a father and daughter who've been friends of mine now for over seven years. We first met at one of Cal Cedin's Law and Liberty events back in 2013 in Washington State. Chris Zimmerman, the dad, is a Cal Cedin underwriter and the father of four. He is an avid student of R.J. Rushduni and co-leads Calcedon's weekly men's online roundtable Bible study. His daughter, Savannah, along with her mother and older sister, graduated from my online Institutes of Biblical Law class through the Calcedon Teacher Training Institute. The Zimmermans are a homeschooling family, and Savannah successfully completed her homeschooling years, fulfilling her parents' requirement that she write a series of position papers reflecting her understanding of what God's Word says on a variety of topics. Both Chris and Savannah, now residents of Nevada, have made their local and statewide news recently, standing up for their constitutional and God-given rights. The question I hope we'll address successfully today is this. What does it take to challenge the status quo? Welcome to you both. Thank you very much, Andrea. Thank you. So Chris, I'll give you an opportunity to share what I referenced above, providing the context and serving as an introduction for Savannah to discuss her recent foray into challenging the status quo. Certainly, they definitely are connected. So uh, back in September of 2019, Uh, My wife and I were making a trip to the local library, which we frequent quite often as homeschoolers. And uh, as we were walking in, a sign caught my wife's attention uh, that was saying that firearms were not permitted in the library, and it was referencing a certain NRS code. Uh, As we came in, I was quickly looking up that NRS code because I didn't have that one in particular memorized. And it was referencing uh, a bit of the law that applied to uh, the child daycares um, and schools. So I quickly engaged with the library staff uh, to ask about that and found out that uh, they were wanting to ban firearms uh, seemingly only in the story time room for the children. Uh, but the references that they were citing in the law were inapplicable to their situation. Now you have to understand in Nevada, Nevada is very much a firearms friendly state or has been for quite some time. It's, it's really the last of the old West States. So for any place to ban firearms, of course, raises an eyebrow and uh, even more so in Nye County uh, where we currently reside uh, as it was one of the first to declare a second amendment sanctuary status. So anyway, that led to a series of uh, meetings where we would attend and uh, speak to the library board. I also reached out to all of our county commissioners uh, because where we live is not an incorporated town. Uh, The county commissioners uh, have the legislative authority over this area. And since they were all unanimous in the Second Amendment sanctuary uh, resolution, we had three of the five show up at the meeting to also speak against this. And that the Lord has used to get us connected with a number of people in the community uh, in fighting this effort to the point where in December and January, we had 70 to 80 people in a Second Amendment rally outside the library. And then we filled the meeting room inside the library, uh, bringing all this uh, home in the last meeting this month in February, just uh, earlier this week. The library staff at the meeting made a public statement that uh, was on record stating that while their efforts were seemingly, in their minds, according to common sense, quote unquote, uh, that they never intended to ban guns throughout the library, that could be debated according to earlier meetings, 
uh, and that all efforts to ban guns in the library would hereby cease and desist. And the uh, policy, code of conduct policy, which stated no weapons in the library was discovered, uh, was also not going to be enforced. So it was a total victory that God granted uh, in this instance. Um, And it was an account after account after account of God's providence working through both our family and those that we were working with uh, in the community, many of whom are not Christian, uh, but yet we know that God can turn the heart of anyone with us, whoever he wishes. As a result of that, uh, the effort that Savannah is a part of, and I'm going to let her speak to it, uh, as she gave her speeches at the library board meetings, one of those was uh, captured by the local television station uh, and posted online and, uh, and, of course, on the television. And it was seen by uh, one of the leaders in the uh, effort to recall the governor of Nevada, and they reached out to Savannah as a result of it. So I'll, I'll pass it off to Savannah to continue. Well, before you do, before you do, I just want a little bit more context. So it sounds like, from what you just described, that it was you who was cha- who you were the one challenging this rule. But didn't Savannah, because she was accompanying your other younger daughter to the library, enter into this in a very, very direct way? Yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, the, so our family, the library has been putting on for quite some time a story time hour where they bring, uh, I think it's up to three-year-olds, um, toddlers to three-year-olds into a room and they read stories and they play little games and whatnot. It's just a fun little time for them. And Savannah would take uh, her younger sister, Verity, to this time and it would give my wife some time to work on some of the homeschooling materials and whatnot and uh, allow Verity to get out and to enjoy some time playing around and listening to stories. She loves that time. Well, Savannah is nine, well, almost 19 years old now, and she is not allowed per state law to go carry concealed. You have to be 21 in the state of Nevada. Uh, and so she has to lean upon the fact that Nevada is an open carry state and she openly carries her firearm all over town, as do I as well. And banning the fire. Okay, let me stop you. Let me stop you. Let's go to Savannah now. So Savannah, um, you're an open carry girl. I imagine that gives you lots of interesting looks. <laughs> it, it does at times, but due to the dynamic of where we live, um, people are actually more open to it. They're, they actually, I get more compliments for open carrying and um, protecting myself than I do negative statements. Um, but yes, I, I do open carry wherever I go, including at home, and uh, you, you'll find me. Okay, so it, explain that a little bit. So open carry means that it's obvious you've got a holster, if you've got something that actually shows that you're carrying a firearm. So the average person might say, so you do this because you're trying to prove a point rather than having a real need or a sense that you need to protect yourself. Explain which of those two it is. Well, I carry because I have a God-given duty to protect myself and those around me. And so while, yes, some people say, well, you're just trying to prove a point, that's not what I'm doing. I, I don't, like Dad said, I don't have the option to conceal it. And so I have to lean on the open carry part. And so while it may appear like I'm trying to prove a point, um, I do it because we live in an evil world, we, in a fallen world with evil people who just, you know, who kill people. And so I have to protect myself and those around me from such things. So, Chris, you're her dad. I've already established that. How do you make sure that as a member of your family who she just said open carries even at home, how do you or how did you make sure she wasn't going to be more of a danger to herself or someone else than an asset. Oh, that's a, that's a tremendous question. So from her earliest years that she can, well, I guess about uh, nine. nine years old when you started firing, but you knew about firearms before that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and with all of our children, we have taught them firearm safety uh, at the very smaller years. They are taught they are never to touch. That is not an option. And, uh, that, and in the youngest years as well, taught them, uh, to tell an adult, 
uh, if they see one, if they're somewhere else and we don't happen to be standing right there. But they're not afraid of them. They're aware of what they are. They're aware that mommy and daddy and, and their sisters and so forth carry them to protect themselves and protect them. Uh, so as they get older, then we then under a uh, heavy supervision, start taking them out and exposing them to firearm safety in an operational perspective. So at the age of nine, Savannah got to go to the range with me. I started working with her and her older sister as well. Uh, and then that progressed to taking actual firearms instruction courses. Uh, and one of the places we've gone is here in Nevada, uh, multiple times. Uh, in the course of that, as part of their homeschooling, uh, I like to do with a big smile on my face, we found out uh, that they had a, a lack in their training where it's one thing to be on the range and shooting at a paper target, and it's just you and dad. It's completely different if you're on a range and you're shooting against somebody else in a competition form in front of an entire class because now you have this adrenaline dump. Well, that revealed to me we need to work on that uh, because obviously if you ever have to defend yourself, that is the biggest adrenaline dump that you'll ever have. Uh, and <laughs> studies have shown that whatever level of training you last received, when you come into a self-defensive tr uh, situation, you're going to be 50% of your best at that last training. So it was, my, it was incumbent upon me to make sure that everyone in my family was going to be trained at the highest percentage that I can get at. So if that event uh, ever did come, and Lord willing it never does, that they would, that 50% would be more than the average person around us. And so I got the girls in, uh, incorporated into the uh, uh, tactical pistol competitions that I've done for 15 years or so. And uh, I have to tell you, Andrea, they were, it didn't take long for them to be nipping at my heels. And I'm pleased to, <laughs> I'm pleased to report that uh, at this last training class that Savannah and I did, she actually beat me, but I will tell you, it was only by one shot. So, okay. I'm, okay. Okay. So let me just, I'm going to just take a little bunny trail here. You said something and I can almost hear a major percentage of the population saying, oh, I see. You told your children not to touch it. And of course, we know that children always obey. So how does your practice of parenting ensure that your children will obey? Okay, uh, so with that, uh, and, and Savannah, you're, you can jump in on this as well as what you've seen. Uh, what we have done uh, is, as with all little children, repetition is key. And uh, so we would, we constantly spot check with our children, even our three-year-old now, what do you do if you see a gun? And if they don't answer it right, you work with them through the correct answer, and then you come back and you try again later. You continue to reinforce it. Now, our children always see guns on our hips and everything, so... It's not as though they don't see them, but they know, and it's, in, it's reinforced over and over and over, you do not touch unless mommy and daddy are there with you and explaining something, but at the younger ages, that's, that's less of a factor. Um, right. So, so this has everything, if, I, if I'm going to sort of lead you here, this has everything to do with your responsibility as a parent how you see it in terms to raise your children so teaching them to respect have a healthy respect for firearms is no different from your point of view than teaching them not to jump out in front of a car look both ways before crossing the street be careful if you're using your steak knife things like that exactly and one other thing i'll add is with our son we all know how little boys are right they can take a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and turn it into a gun so, uh, <laughs> and, and I have absolutely no problem with that. But one of the things that we enforced, uh, cause my, our son has all kinds of toy guns and wood guns and whatnot. And one of the things we have reinforced from the very beginning is you can shoot at all the pretend bad guys that you want, but you cannot point any toy gun at anybody in the family or any person whatsoever. And if you violate that rule, the toy guns all get scooped up. And you don't get them back until you can recite all four gun safety rules to me without failure. And I'll tell you, that's happened two or three times. He's made that mistake and not, you know, over a period of several years. And uh, it is, uh, it has reinforced it for him to where if other little boys come over, maybe boys from uh, church friends or whatever, and they want to start shooting each other, he'll jump in and go, no, 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 we don't do that. And he'll, he'll redirect and say, well, 
let's shoot the bad guys that are pretend behind the trees and police, you know, pretend to be police officers. Uh, it, so it all goes together. We, we treat the toy guns with the same respect as the real ones would be so that as he gets older, it's not a matter of flipping the switch and all of a sudden he's going to think as an adult. It's rather he's thinking as the adult, as the child. Okay, Savannah, let me throw this over to you. So as somebody who has been around guns, not since you can remember, but certainly since the time you were young, what's your attitude when you go out and open carry? A lot of people, well, is she looking for trouble? Is she trying to use her skills? What's your attitude? How do you perceive what it is you do on a daily basis? Well, it's a big responsibility. Um, I've been carrying for almost a year now, and that first day that I, I holstered up and I walked out that front door, there was this weight that I felt like I carried. I knew more than just the weight that was on my belt. Um, it was the weight of a responsibility of knowing that every shot that comes out of this gun is a liability, and that I only pull this out if I have to. If I do not have to, then I won't pull it out. Um, so it, it's an attitude of um, I have a big responsibility here and I, I need to make sure I don't uh, abuse that responsibility. I need to make sure I'm still respectful of the gun and make sure I'm still respectful of things around me too. Okay, so you said if you have to pull it out. So pulling it out isn't the same thing as shooting it. Is that correct? Depending on the situation, yes. There, there are instances where you may have to pull the gun out, um, but the threat then runs away and you put it right back because you did not have to fire a shot. So there's a lot of discipline that is built into all the training that your father made sure you had because sometimes people will be dissuaded from giving you a hard time knowing that you have um, a firearm. And other times, as you indicated, it might mean more than that. So how do you, as a young woman, make sure that in the use of your firearm, you're aware of the potential for collateral damage? Well, what the biggest thing would be staying in condition yellow. Um, at the firearms instruct during the firearm instruction course that we've taken, they always teach you that there are different color codes or there's a color code of a mental awareness you know you have condition white and that is where you are totally oblivious to everything around you you have condition yellow where you're looking around but you you don't see a threat but you're making sure you're making eye contact with people and they know hey I, i'm watching you i've got this then you have condition orange and that's you have identified someone that looks as a potential threat but they haven't shown any um indications that they're going to start something right then and there that then can progress into condition red, which is they are now pulling a gun out or a knife, making threats. Um, and uh, so after that, if that continues on, you then hit condition black. And that is the actual fight where they have turned on you or they are uh, holding a hostage or something. And they're saying, I'm going to kill you. And you have to then present your weapon and deliver your controlled pair or deliver a headshot or something. Um, so as a young lady... I have to make sure I am staying in condition yellow. I have to make sure I'm, I'm watching those around me and um, making sure that I am making eye contact with those that look like they're a little shady, that they're, you know, they're, they're presenting that body language of they're nervous. They're not making eye contact with anybody. They're looking around really strangely. Um, so yeah, that, that's, so that's pretty great. much, let me, am I correct in saying that if you're carrying your firearm with you and you're in public, you're pretty much always in condition yellow? Yes. I, I, I leave my phone in my purse as much as possible. So I don't have to get in that condition. One, Cause that is a great position to be in for a, a bad guy. Cause if he saw me on my phone, I'm not watching for anybody around me. So I, I do make sure I'm in condition yellow when I'm out and about. And how do you ensure, or at least try to ensure, that someone who notices that you have a firearm, since you have to open carry, that they don't try to take your firearm? That, that's a great question. Um, there's several things that you do or I do 
Um, first one's a holster. You make sure you got a good enough holster that um, has retention so that the gun can't be pulled out or it can only be pulled out one direction. For example, my holster that I have, can, my gun is only coming out one way, and that's if I pull it out. No one behind me can pull it out. Um, another thing is, like I said, staying in condition yellow. If somebody is right behind you and you don't know that, or they're reaching for your gun and you don't know that, you're obviously not in the right condition that you need to be in. Um, like in big Z crowds, it, it gets interesting. So that's where I do something where I um, leave my arm right over my gun or I'll kind of rest my elbow on it so that if someone does try to get it, they're bumping me first and I immediately look on that in that direction. Um, but the biggest one is staying in condition yellow and making sure you know who's around you because the average person can run 21 feet in about one and a half seconds. So you've got to kind of keep that range around of, okay, who's behind me? Who's, who's right behind me in the checkout line at Walmart? Or what are they doing? Are, are they digging in their pockets of a hoodie? Do they have their hood on and it's 100 degrees out? Um, so th those kinds of things. I once heard the expression that says an armed society is a polite society. And I live in California, which is famous for all its gun-free zones. And we always laugh because, of course, the person who has bad intentions obviously follows these rules that says no guns allowed. So in essence, and I think everybody would agree, this puts the person who is not likely to try to do other people harm in a defenseless position. Well, what would you say, Savannah, to people who say, you must be a very, very um, cynical, untrusting person. You go through life assuming that people are out there to hurt you. Um, doesn't that affect your ability to have relationships with other people? Yes and no. It, it depends on the person because ultimately it's, it's not that I am untrusting or, you know, constantly thinking everyone's guilty and they have to prove themselves to be innocent. Um, it's, you know, I know we are all born into this world totally depraved. And so I know nobody is good and I have to think about that when I think about, okay, you know, there are people out there that will go into a Walmart, like the one in El Paso and just start shooting the place up. Um, it's not because I'm afraid to walk out the door without my gun, but I have to be able to protect myself because what if I'm in that Walmart and somebody's shooting and I now cannot protect myself? You no, know, a good example would be, you, you know, you could turn it around on them and say, well, why do you wear a seatbelt then? in a car. Is that because you don't trust your driving? Do you not trust those people around you? Well, no, it's because it's safer that way. That way, when if you have a crash, you don't go flying out the front windshield. Okay, Chris, I'm going to go back to you now. Um, yeah. As a dad, I know you adhere to biblical law, and you have endeavored to not only live it yourself, but to teach it and seek application. Well, the Bible's pretty clear that women shouldn't go to war. And yet, it seems like a contradiction that you have trained your daughters to sort of do just that. Um, is that what you've trained them to do, to be ready to go to war? Or have, what, what, what's, what was the, the rationale that said, well, is this what ladies are supposed to do? Is this how you train and raise feminine women? Right, right. No, uh, I certainly am not raising uh, tactical daughters. Okay, maybe they're cool, but they're not tactical. So uh, <laughs> Savannah gave me a look. So uh, what we see throughout scripture, and, and I could cite a number of passages. I'll just cite the one of the woman who's being attacked, and she's supposed to cry out. Uh, and uh, the scripture goes on to say that then the people are to come in and provide that rescue. But if she doesn't cry out, then she is uh, – complicit with the act and cannot then later on say, well, I was attacked or assaulted or whatever. Um, in the course of that crying out, uh, it is uh, presumed, it is assumed that she is fighting back. I mean, by the very fact that she's crying out, she's fighting back. And by teaching my daughters how to defend themselves, whether it be with a firearm or a knife or whatever it may be, that's simply a tool. The firearm just happens to be the most effective tool that we have in our uh, within our reach at this point uh, to resist and to fight back against that, uh, that attack. Now we know that, and, and Dr. Rushton, he talks about this, but uh, we know that the, the man was created 
to be the protector and the woman was created to be a nurturer, right? And the two together complement one another very, very well. And as such, that carries over into the self-defense world. So from a biblical mindset, the man, the male has the uh, responsibility to take the offense, right? To go into the situation uh, and to uh, go after the attacker uh, that may be assaulting somebody else or whatever it may be. Whereas uh, the female we, we see in scripture is a, a defensive, uh, she's in a defensive role. So she doesn't, she's not the primary. She's not uh, the one who would go onto the front line of battle. She has the duty because of the, the very way that God has designed the woman is, as a nurturer, it is damaging to that for her to take an offensive uh, position because she's just not built for that. Um, it's not that she is incapable of taking a rifle, but uh, it, it is it is misaligned with what she was created for. So I have raised up our daughters uh, with that mindset that uh, you have a defensive role, not an offensive role. And that, that defensive role may include uh, where you have to scoop up your younger siblings and get them out of a store, that, let's say, uh, meanwhile having to maybe deliver shots if somebody's coming after you. That's a very different thing than myself and maybe a couple of other men going after somebody doing a public shooting uh, to, to get him to stop. I, I hope I've illustrated that well. No, you have. And I think what I was driving at, and you adequately explained it, is that everything you're doing, you're doing deliberately. And you're not saying, well, okay, I know the scripture says no to this, but we have to do this because the world we live in. You're being faithful to scripture in how you have trained and prepared your daughters because if the Bible says rape is a capital offense, which it does say it is, then preventing yourself, for example, from being raped is your responsibility just the same way that we shouldn't steal. But if someone is stealing from you, you're not supposed to say, like the culture would say, well, if, if a man's trying to rape a woman, the best thing she can do is not fight back and not give in. That's antithetical to the biblical position. Exactly. Okay, back to you, Savannah. So you got all this notoriety. You're in the newspaper. You're on television. Did that surprise you? It, it did, actually. Um, I, I was not expecting it at all. Well, what's funny to me is that our institute's class lasted for at least four years. So when you started, you were a middle teen ager, as they would say. And I remember you not so much being hesitant about what you believed, but boy, were you always questioning everything. Probably you gave your parents their share of gray hairs that they have because you wanted to know why. Why is this so? Why does God's word say this? So how did doing those position papers and having to have discussions with your father and your mother help you come to your position as to how you viewed the things that were important and the things that were not? Well, it gave me um, appreciation for them teaching me and explaining them, explaining things uh, because it, it got tough at times and, like you said, I probably did give him a, a good share of gray hairs because of it. Um, but I, I also saw the benefit of doing these papers because I'm not very good at writing, um, like writing a speech or writing a position paper. And so doing those papers, you know, I think I had 25 of them I wrote. The more I did it, the easier it got. And while it still is challenging, the benefit came um, of when I, you know, I had to write my speeches for the library. But also it taught me that, you know, I'm not just doing things because, you know, we, we say or, you know, my parents say or somebody says so, um, but because God says so. Right. And I believe as a parent, that's where you want your children to be. You, you appreciate the fact that they might credit you with the viewpoints and where they first learned them, but you have to own them yourself, especially as you move about the adult world. Mm -hmm. and, and it really formed uh, an opportunity for us to work with both of our daughters, and we'll do it with our youngers as well, 
to sharpen them because Savannah would write a position paper up and make a statement in there that was either not supported or I knew she didn't know where that came from per se, perhaps. And I would challenge her on it uh, and say, well, what about this? Or you said this, well, how would you take that and apply it to this situation? You need to be able to address this in your position paper. And we would go back and forth and back and forth quite a bit. Uh, mm-hmm. But it sharpened her because nobody come, nobody's born in this world being able to just uh, articulate their positions without fault. It takes practice to be able to do that. And the fruit of that, of course, were, was the speeches that she gave at the library. So just to be clear, and for people who are raising children in a homeschool setting, You didn't require that she agree with you on every point. You required that she could substantiate any point of view she had from Scripture. Correct. All right. I know at times, Savannah, it must not always have seemed that way, but knowing how your dad loves apologetics, (laughs) I'm sure you've got a workout. (laughs) That that is true. (laughs) Okay, so you're famous or semi-famous in your locale. And then you get a phone call asking you to do what? So, yes, uh, after everything that happened at the library, I was contacted by a member of Fight for Nevada, and they asked me to become Nye County leader, which is the county that we are in, for recalling Governor Sisolak. Um, The previous county leader could not continue on, and she had seen the, the clip that, the news took from the library and seen me in the paper and um, thought I would be the best person for that job. So they must have known how old you were because your whole crux of your argument that I saw on the video clip was that you weren't allowed to carry a concealed weapon because of your age. So they called a 19 year old to head this campaign or this, this whole drive within your county? Did did they remember how old you were? Some of them did. Some of them didn't. Um, The one that the the previous county leader knew how old I was, and she was hoping that by having a younger person in the county lead spot, um, it would encourage other young folk to stand up for what's right and stand up against tyranny and to, um, you know, be involved in politics because, it doesn't do any good to have the older generations doing all this political stuff, but the youngers won't even bother with it. So what's so bad about your governor? (laughs) Very good question. He is passing or wanting to pass laws that are unconstitutional. They are taking away, some of them take away parental rights. And um, very many of them are anti-gun. For example, one of the bills um, would allow school nurses to give a daughter, your daughter, an, the morning after pill because she asked for it. Doesn't matter what her age is, she can ask for it. So someone at the age of ten could ask for a morning after pill of her school teacher and the uh, sorry school nurse, and the nurse does not have to report that to her parents. So you're not just focused on Second Amendment issues. Um, As someone who knows the Constitution and knows God's law, you're going to be able to call public officials to a standard that's laid out in the Bible. Yes. So those position papers, as tedious or as troublesome as they may have seemed all those times, are serving you in good stead, huh? Yes, they are. (laughs) All right, Chris, back to you. Um, how would you encourage, I mean, this isn't about telling all homeschooling dads to become Second Amendment advocates, but gun safety, gun instruction, these are all things that are very much a part of your life, so it was pretty natural that you would share this with your family. How would you advise them? Would you say your causes have to be their causes, or how would you help them apply what they're hearing today to their own families? So you're right. It does not, it, that does not mean that every family has to make Second Amendment issues their central issue. Not everybody is a, a little pinky toe. I'll give myself that much credit, I guess. I'll be the pinky toe, right? Um, everybody has a different part of the body. 
Um, but that doesn't mean that we don't all have a responsibility to those areas that aren't our main focus. Um, so for a family that, uh, for a family that may, uh, be in the battle, um, much more heavily for, uh, the, to defend life for unborn babies, uh, that doesn't mean that you're off the hook for the second amendment issues either. Um, frankly, that there's a connection between the two because we're both defending life. It's just two different aspects of it. Um, but what I would encourage uh, other families, especially homeschool families, is one of the best tools that the enemy has is one of desperation, uh, putting, putting us into a mindset of desperation or, uh, uh, what is it, fatalism, right? It, it, what's going to happen is going to happen, and there's nothing we can do about it. We see in the scriptures throughout not only the eschatology of victory, that, that God's kingdom will grow and fill this earth as the waters cover the sea before the return of Christ, but that God works through his people, uh, not exclusively, uh, he can do it on his own, but he works through his people to accomplish his will and grants victories to his people who are stepping out in faith. We can see examples of that with the Puritans. We can see examples of that with Cromwell. We can see examples of that just go back all through history. We, we the Bible is replete with it. It, that's, it is the uh, resulting outworking of post-millennial thinking, um, knowing that if you go in and you're going to give a testimony before a Senate panel or a library board or wherever it may be, hold to those presuppositions. And wisdom would, would dictate, don't just try to clobber somebody with Bible verses, but rather take those Bible verses and explain the why behind it and hold to those presuppositions, knowing that God's word never returns void. And at the same time, those imprecatory prayers that everyone seems to be afraid to pray, pray them. Pray them against the enemies of God and that he would have them in derision, throw them into confusion, and grant his people the victory. And that's what we see here. That's what our family has been praying. Um, and it's the boldness that we go in. Uh, to one of these events. We, we've testified before Senate panels. We've testified before uh, legislatures and, and boards and county commissioners and everything, um, knowing that our, the responsibility is ours, but the consequences are up to God. So I would encourage every family, find what your calling is as a family, what those things are that, you're, that you as a family are going to fight for, because we're all in a battle, and get in there and get in the fight. That may mean joining an organization and helping them, or it may mean you have to stand on your own. But if that's the case, so be it. God is aware of it. So step forward and, and let's get these things done. Well, I say amen to that. And I would add that a lot of criticism that comes out towards homeschooling families is that you're retreatist, you're, you're trying to protect your children from the real world. Well, your family is a testimony to the fact that the real world, the world of Jesus Christ and his law and the scriptures is what you're working to have shine in your community. So I imagine, and, and maybe it's already happened, that there are ample opportunities when people want to know, Mr. Zimmerman, how is it that your 19-year-old daughter is so articulate and she's able to substantiate her positions and why, that it gives you plenty of opportunity to share your faith, to share that homeschooling is anything other than a hide-in-the-cave mentality. Yes, that's all, in fact, that's already happened, even with uh, my eight-year-old son, because he also gave speeches at these events, and people were amazed at how articulate he was and the fact that he was not afraid to get up in front of a group of, in this case, 80 people that he had no idea who was in the room and speak his mind. And he worked on the speeches, uh, did 99% of it, except for some grammar and punctuation that we helped him with, uh, and then delivered these speeches. Uh, and I have people at my office who have interacted with him and are now approaching me asking about homeschooling on their own. Yeah. It goes back to the idea that we're supposed to let our light shine. Uh, I would say in the case for both of you and then the rest of your family, you're not living your life so that others are impressed. You're living your life to be faithful. And as a result of that, others take notice. Exactly. 
So Savannah, um, how would you encourage some homeschooling students who might feel like, oh, is this ever going to end? Um, I don't know that I can take this anymore. How would you encourage them being on the other side of homeschooling, discussing why they should hang in there with the, uh, the course of study their parents have provided? And let me interrupt one question one, real quick before you answer that, Savannah. I want to just remind you of physics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I remember physics. Remember that conversation? Uh, Go ahead. Uh, well, I would just, I would encourage them that, yes, I know it's tough. Yes, I know it seems like it's a never-ending road. You're never going to get there. It doesn't seem like, you know, what on earth does algebra have to do with the real life? Um, but just to keep on going, I know it's tough now, but it you'll see the benefits in the end. You know, when I graduated, I thought, oh, I'm going to have all this time in the world to do everything I want. <laughs> yeah, that that didn't end up working out. But now I'm, you know, doing things that I never thought I would do. Uh, but had I not stuck through with school and stuck through with my presentation papers, I, I wouldn't be in the position I am now. Um so yeah, it would just be, I know it's tough, pray for strength, and keep on chugging along. You've, you've got this. <laughs> okay, now you've got me curious. What about physics? <laughs> well, uh, when I got to my physics book in school, I remember reading it. I have, before I continue on, I have a really hard time understanding abstract concepts. You can tell me information, but if it doesn't affect my life, I'm not really interested in it. Um, so when I got to physics, I started reading through it, and the first chapter, I believe, was on the three laws. And I'm looking at Dad like, I don't understand this at all. I don't know what this is going to do with my life. I don't really need physics because it doesn't do anything. It's just science. It's like chemistry. It's just it. It's just there. It's It's gravity, you know. So he sat me down, and he worked me through each of the three laws, and he would, he said, once, when these all work together, you use this on a daily basis. And, you know, I hadn't, I don't, I didn't ride at the time. Uh, but now that I do ride my own motorcycle, you use physics all the time. You have to think, okay, head on collision. That's going to result in, you know, if we're both going 60 miles an hour, that's like me hitting a brick wall at 120 miles an hour. Well, that's physics that affected my life. So it, that was kind of the, uh, the thing with dad and I was, you know, physics, I didn't think I needed it. And he started explaining it. And now I find out I do actually need physics and I have to understand it. <laughs> you ride a motorcycle. Now people are going to say, wow, what a package this girl is. Open carry rides motorcycles. Anything else we should know about you, Savannah? <laughs> and she's theonomic. And I'm a gearhead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. All right. Well, thank you both. I think the, um, I think the answer to the question, what does it take to challenge the status quo, can be answered by um, fear God and keep his commandments, know his commandments, and knowing which fight you should fight. Would you agree? Yes, absolutely. All right. And I believe, Chris, at least at one point you did, do you still do firearms training? I haven't since we moved to Nevada. When we were up in Washington, I, I had a side business, a family business of Christian firearms training. Um, I still have all those materials. I certainly could do the training, uh, and but I've been focusing my attentions on serving in the community at this point. Uh, and uh, if anyone was ever interested in going through that material, I'd be happy to sit down and go through it with them. And how would they get a hold of you? Well, they can reach out, uh, that they can contact Calcedon, and Calcedon can provide some contact info. Um, I don't know if there's another means that people can reach out to me um, that is public. Um, okay, so why don't we do it this way? Since those who are listening are listening to the Out of the Question podcast, if someone listening is interested in having uh, a personal conversation with um, Chris, that you can write to us at out of the question podcast at gmail.com and I will pass along your email information to him and then he can get in touch with you. And so that way 
um, we're only putting people in touch with each other who want to be in touch with each other. Absolutely. That would work just fine. Okay. Well, I appreciate you both um, sharing and uh, it's been fun for me and we don't see each other nearly enough. So it was a good opportunity to visit and listeners, if you have any comments or questions about this, or any suggestion for future podcasts, use that same email address out of the question podcast at gmail.com and we'll be with you next time. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to Out of the Question. For more information on this and other topics, please visit calcedon.edu.